Hi, and welcome to the Orca Group series. We're talking to Andy Schmid today, who's a wildlife photographer, and we'll get a bit more into what he does professionally. Um, Andy's images have been all over the group. Uh, you've seen the one where the orc is underneath the baseball, which everyone loves. It's a striking image. Um, we ha we're also here today with Elena, you know, Elena from the group. And um, what we'll do now is we're going to pass it over to Andy. And Andy, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so hi, everybody. Um, hi, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me uh, today for this session. Um, I've been a member of the group for for a while, so I've also seen a few of your of your um, previous episodes. Um, and then you approached me, and I thought that's a that's a good idea. I'll be I'll be um, one of your guests, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm an, primarily an ocean uh, and underwater photographer, but I'm into photography in general. Um, I've been doing that for quite a while. And so initially I started um, diving um, when I was in my 20s somewhat. And I just dove around different places, just really into it and kind of became first became kind of a professional diver. Like a, um, I became a dive guide. And it was only after that. So when I when I was a, a, a kind of a, a good diver already, when I thought about showing people what I saw, you know, you had your friends and whatever relatives that did not fully understand what you were doing and why you were constantly wanting to go to the ocean and things like that. Especially for me, coming from from Switzerland, landlocked, uh, grew up uh, more like. Um, with the passion and love for mountains and not for the ocean. And so for, for people here, it, it wasn't always understandable. So that's why I grabbed the camera and, and started slowly getting into it. First approaches were, were terrible. I wasn't a good photographer right away. And you started with just what you saw, right? So you, like, for example, I went to places like Egypt and whatever you would, would find underwater, you would take photos of. Uh, without a concept or anything but then later on I started really getting into it and um, learning how it really works learning about photography move away from the actual diving and more dive into theories of photography um, and then educating myself also on subjects potential subjects that I would want to see um, where it would be possible to see them and then try to make it happen. And this is along the journey. So it's it's really a long journey. So um, I started taking photos, I would say it was either in 2009 or 10. Um, and the first time I went to Norway to see orcas um, was in 2006. 18 17 17 or 18 um so we took quite some years to even come up with the idea to to um to take on this challenge and try to to uh take photos of of one of the most challenging uh, animals to take photos of i would say due to many factors um not not that common to see um and then their just their speed and and their awareness and it's fully up to them whether you can get an encounter or not so it's it's not that easy and um so i before i did that i just kind of tried to to gain as much experience as i could in the ocean on the ocean uh, with all kinds of 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 ocean inhabitants um, of different sizes. Andy, you you mentioned that um, you grew up in Switzerland, which again you mentioned that it was landlocked. Um, do you know what? You know it's really interesting. But how how did how did that shape your distinct perspective of being an underwater photographer? How did how did that shape your your approach to it? I'm not sure there's there's a, a relation there in terms of like creative vision or or you know approach in in 
terms of photography. But what I would say is I've always been very, very active. So when I when I was a, a, a kid and a teen, like my 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 main interest was was uh, snowboarding and basketball. So it was just about sports and uh, snowboarding, um, mainly in the outdoors and in the mountains, right? So it was always for me. I would I could never be just you know like sitting inside and not doing any active sports and so. And the the actual start of my diving journey was related to that because it was um, back in two thousand three. I went to, with a with a former uh, girlfriend back then. We went to um, Mexico, and it was kind of a you know like a relaxation beach kind of trip. And as soon as we got there, because I'd, I had never really been to the ocean like this. I was I was amazed by the place, but I was also pretty pretty quickly kind of bored with just you know sitting on the beach and reading a book, which is not my 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 thing. So I was looking for what I could do, and then I uh, saw the opportunity to to snorkel. I did that for a bit, and then I discovered um, a dive center right there. So and. I started. I started right away. Did my certification, my first certification, and and was was really hooked from the from the beginning on, 2003. So 20 years ago, and um, I have hardly done any other trips than than ocean and dive or snorkel related trips ever since. So this is kind of yeah, where what, it started. What? What areas of the world? We know we went to Norway, but has there been anywhere else in the world that you went to see orca or try to shoot them? Not specifically for orcas. I had hoped in in uh, two areas to maybe see them. If 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 you get lucky, I mean nowadays you see a lot of footage coming out of the of the Baja California of orcas. It, I mean it's always pretty much the same individuals like a, it's a small population but but they are they have spotters in 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 the air nowadays and things like that so it's not so hard to to actually see them but the, i think there's too much pressure on them but that's another story um back when i was there the last time it wasn't like this there weren't there weren't too many operators uh yet and um and it was hard to see them there were reports from a week before they have been seen by fishermen or something like this, but um, not a chance to see them. And the other um, the other place would have been the Galapagos, but also there they're really rare, and and uh, and so it's it's just a question of luck to see them. Not I wasn't there for to see orcas, so it was more a place where you could get lucky but not where you go to if you absolutely wish to wish to see these animals so um andy um i was talking to a guy called roy balvert uh in another interview um he's he's up next actually in terms of um publication and he's the ceo of a company in uh, norwich does orca tours um, you, what you mentioned about California kind of speaks to that too, in which um, it's becoming even increasingly more popular to start up a company to provide these orca tours out to see um, orca. Um, both Hannah Strager and Roy mentioned that the largest or the larger groups uh, that do um, touring companies follow the primary guidelines, but because our um, Norway is uh, not regulated or doesn't have any primary laws or regulations against going out to see the orca that um, some photographers and other people go out with private boats to see them and they don't follow the guidelines. Do you have any thoughts around this as a photographer um, and, and who has previously went to Norway? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, which, by the way, is, is not like this obvious but i'm i'm a i co-run um expeditions to norway as a as a tour leader as an expedition leader and and guide um and i work with a with a norwegian captain 
who's been been working in this in this uh, area for a long time for another comp uh, company before and now with his own boat and and um, we're kind of a small operation but so I'm I spend a lot of time there through the past let's say four years I've spent a lot of time up there and so seen a lot of um things happening out in, on the ocean but also around the whole thing there's been talks about it because there's been like uh, situations where it, it was getting out of control with too many boats around and things like that um it's it's difficult because there are regulations in place which are not being enforced to some extent for example because there's so usually this this happens in an area north of Tromso at the moment, right? And um, so they have they have rental, like small rental cabins, and with those you can rent small boats. And these for, to to rent these you don't need to fulfill a lot of you know um, uh, prerequisites you can you can pretty simply go and and, and rent these i mean of, of course you need to be licensed for for uh, boating but not much more than that and uh, this this draws a lot of people um up there that that want to do it that way because they can be independent um it's 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 more affordable and so on um but so going back to these regulations um when when there were discussions in norway about this um, in the area where it's happening, it was outlined that there are laws that would uh, require you to have specific um, gear on the boat, safety um, gear, you know, like like uh, radio and things like that. And if you don't have these, then you cannot actually do what you what you're doing when you're going out there to watch whales. What these boats usually are for, and the cabins is is during summertime they're being used um, to go fishing, and so also these places they usually just call in different towns and 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 areas where you where you find them they're called fish camps. So you get you you rent a little hut, you rent a boat, you go out fishing in the summer, and now they're being used as well for 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 these. Um, to try and go see whales, right? And uh, also getting in the water and things like that. And they're sometimes, yeah, there's plenty of these boats out there. And so if, and I'm not um, like an official from there or, or, or like, I don't know the laws that precisely. So um, I'm just kind of quoting or saying what I, what I see and what I hear is that these boats should not be out there technically, um, but they are. And so you would think, why is there nobody, um, you know, waiting at the harbor entrance and, and uh, f giving handing them out fines when they come back or something like this, preventing them to go out. And this is just not happening. So it's the enforcement that is not, not happening, I guess. Um, ourselves, we've had, we've had like officials come to, our boat so we we operate off a, a bigger boat that stays docked for the day and we just go out with a with a with a rib and they've inspected the whole thing so they went through all the papers and making sure it's officially ran even including myself coming from switzerland to do some work there that i have like official papers with the government and like uh, proof of me paying taxes and things like that which which kind of makes sense, right? Because otherwise, it should be a Norwegian person doing this. So, uh, and and these Why are you things. Why smaller vessels aren't being um, audited? Yeah, yeah, and there also you, if you're if you're um, you know looking at this from a business perspective, I could be a, a, a photographer saying I run my own thing, you know, um, have four people that can just pay me amount X, I will organize um, accommodation in the boat and, and they will um, get to see the whales. And everybody comes from outside of Norway and none of the, this money goes to goes to Norway. So there's always uh, also a kind of a, a financial 
situation and, and aspect there. That's interesting. Well, That's like the first time I. Yeah, it seems like it would make more sense for a harbor master to keep a lot more attention on what boats are going in and going out and making sure that some of those tourism uh, monies actually make it into Norway's uh, treasury. Because that is business that Norway would arguably be entitled to. Yeah, and that's also that's also you know we so there's a there's a, a town hall um, meeting. There's been a town hall meeting for the past two or three years every year for sure for once or so, where a lot of people come in and and talk about these things. And so this is also one of the main or, or one of the concerns of, of of the locals because they're seeing part of kind of what they would have as a business opportunity being taken away from them without anything happening against it, which is, mm. which is, um, um, I totally understand that it's frustrating. That's a, that's a, that's a point of view that I've never heard before. Mm. And I have, like, I've, I know that the, there's regulations in becoming a captain, but there versus no protections as such for the Orca themselves. Uh, is what I was getting at. Um, yep. but moving, but moving on from that, um, and and back to your your photography, uh, Andy. Um, can you share a specific photo that embodies the urgency for change in uh, in how we treat the oceans, and what emotions do you hope it triggers? Um, absolutely, yeah. Let me quickly share my screen. Um. Here it is. Wow. I'm guessing you can see that? We can, yeah. Okay. So um, just generally speaking, um, I mean, this is uh, this. I, I've, so I've picked two images, actually. So this is one of them. Um, I really, I really like it um for for various reasons but also right right now it's just making rounds and uh in in, in uh, photography competitions so it's putting me in a spotlight where i've not been to this day um so this is really amazing news from from various competitions where i've entered it coming in over the last few weeks that i placed well or even won like specific prices or, or ranked very high so this is like super um it just personally to 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 have this um recognition in 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 with regards to this image um also it's it really just shows kind of the dynamics that are happening when when orcas are feeding in norway on on uh on herring yeah with this donut shaped it, it, i mean it used to be a ball right until she um came rushing in and and just kind of made them try to escape and it's just amazing what 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 uh, how everything is happening underwater with the power of such a beautiful animal it looks like she was um successful <laughs> yeah she is yeah she yeah. was there's so quite a be, few uh, yeah, there's if quite a few that are ready to snag. She's she's got a yeah. she's got a herring coming out of her mouth here. So the yeah. markings are beautiful, aren't they, Andy? It's absolutely they're just a beautiful animal. God. Yeah, absolutely. Your contrast you and light is that? fantastic. How did you feel when you got this shot? I mean, this one is particularly detailed, and she's just right at the center of the whole photograph. Um the composition is excellent. You must have had a lot of emotions taking this photo. Well, I I must say, just in general, last last season, so the, this was taken uh, last November. It was just um, outstanding. And just to just quickly go back to what we talked before. So our uh, operation is always trying to avoid any crowds. So whenever we see fins but then we see other boats then we always know um we find something else and we we really never join and we always try to find our own 
um, orcas or it can be humpback whales also. And, and just look around and sometimes drive for hours to find something, but then eventually, usually we, we, we get lucky at some point. And this was the case with both of the images I've, I've picked. Um, it was just us with um, with uh, feeding orcas that were going on for, for a long time without any disturbances, without nothing, just us in the water, orcas um, enjoying the herring, um, us trying to kind of not interrupt the whole thing and and then just really um enjoying the whole the whole the whole scene and also um coming back to your initial question when i when i pulled out the image uh, nick uh, regarding um conservational aspects so i'm i'm not trying with my photography to go out there you know and capture um you know negative aspects of what humans are doing to nature um or for example also you could you could go out there and and capture the negative sides of of the of what we talked about before if you have a situation with a lot of boats just kind of have boats surrounding whales something like this uh this is not what i'm trying to to capture what i try to capture is really just the the beauty um that we that we see that we still have capture it and by displaying it trying to make people understand that it's worth um protecting also right now for example if you think about what what's happening in 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 uh, in the area between portugal and spain and and gibraltar where yeah. some maniacs uh, now think they need to kind of bring bombs or whatever you know to on 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 the boats and and things like that i mean yeah it's it's just makes me sad and 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 they should kind of see things like that and and maybe educate themselves a bit more and think about why this is happening and not um take it personal and think they want to sink them or whatever it's incredibly frustrating, Andy, because uh, I was recently talking to uh, Monica Gonzalez from uh, Orca Librica GTOA, who is the scientist, main scientist in Portugal, with this phenomena. Um, and she said that people are stopping um, producing, you know, um, the information. They're not, not sending in data anymore. And the governments are not speaking to one another and the scientists are not communicating with one another so this problem is continually getting worse and worse and worse now mm -hmm. um yeah uh, that's that's on a future episode um to be released but it's it's very interesting gosh but very sad um mm -hmm. but this picture this this picture that you just showed um can you describe for me the composition of light because i'm trying to understand what's going on it's it's such a dynamic picture um and i think the light where the light is shining from an odd perspective it's like it's shining upwards almost uh and then downwards can you can you just describe that a little bit for me what what was what was happening with the light yeah, it was it was a I remember it was an overcast day. So um the other the other picture that I have is from another day. Um we didn't have um too much like it was I think this was the 19th November. So it's towards um the polar nights. So the 25th November is the last day the sun rises. And then you have polar nights until mid-January, that area around. And so on the 19th of November, you already don't have that much light uh, left. You still you still have a like a norm kind of normally bright day when it's not overcast, but when it's overcast, it can get already quite dark. And I think what you see, what you see here in the middle part, um where it's so bright here is mainly because the the surface was kind of breaking right on top of it and then it's what you have this whitewash or so probably you know you see my mouse when i when i do this 
Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. So up here, I guess, you know, you have a lot of kind of whitish bits and then this, this kind of helped illuminating the, the, the donut from the inside. It's not, it's not intention or so, you know, a lot with, with wildlife photography is, especially in settings like these with animals as fast as these, you can't really plan for something like this to happen. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm free diving, right? So I'm a few meters down and below her, but you can just kind of in your inner eye picture what in an ideal world maybe could happen, but yeah. you know, there's no way to plan it, right? It's and truly so, a magic moment, isn't it, Andy? Gosh. Yeah. And and to 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 get something like this is is uh is just takes you many many hours there in the water and patience and trial and error and everything. So it's not it's not that I've gone up there and and just got lucky. It's is a long is a long way to to get there. This might be a difficult question to answer, um, but for the photographers that are listening to this. Um, would you happen to know what your settings were on your camera? Um, so always, so I'm I'm shooting with a fisheye um, that has a 2.8, um, an f 2.8. And I, in Norway, I always have it open to the max. So at 2.8. Um, and I usually shoot at something the the shutter something between either uh, 125th or 160th that would be my shutter speed and then play around with the iso so for people that have never been there my recommendation would be to have the iso on auto but this could this can cause the ISO in, in certain moments to go all the way up to whatever, 25,000 or so. And then you have just a, a big, big noisy mess. Um, so the, the more comfortable you get in situations like this and, and understand your, your, your gear and your camera, the more you can play around with, with these settings and, and then maybe just put the ISO also on manual and then, um, Put it maybe too deep at first, and then try to to get like the right exposure um, with with like a minimal noise. You will still have some noise. It's not possible up there to get like fully fully crisp pictures like you would be in a tropical sunny paradise. It's it's just different conditions in the water. It's amazing. Yeah, thanks very so much for that. Bit, a bit of bit of geeky answer, but. <laughs> No, the photographers that watch this will will absolutely love and appreciate that bit of a voice. Mm. Um, this is kind of a geeky channel. <laughs> yeah, we're very geeky, actually. Um, I don't know if you see it, but do you know what? I love spirals. I love the Fibonacci sequence. And that's the closest I've ever seen anything close to the Fibonacci sequence in um, in a wild shot like that. It's beautiful. I love it. God, it's lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can see that being a winner, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so personally, um, always I always enter this as well. And yeah. uh, I had I had initially when when I came back from from last season, I had the highest hopes in this picture. Um, to be honest, it's not it's not won anything in competitions, but to me, it's still it's still absolutely um, amazing. Also, you know, we the full the full bait ball is there. It's not it's not a crop or so. It's really I I shot it um, portrait, not landscape, which I really like as as a format. But I think this is actually. Um, part of the reason also why it never placed in in a competition but it's, i love that picture it, and and uh, um a friend a friend uh said to me um when i when i asked like i don't i don't fully understand why it's the other picture and not this one he said well um you're probably you're probably just too focused on also you know this this is a, a large male 
you know, versus a less big female or so. I mean, kind of as a joke, but um, I don't know. Maybe like in my subconsciousness, he's not fully wrong. I don't know. No, I I don't. I, I, I pectoral fins. I love how yeah. how he flared. Yeah, it's huge, right? He's a big guy, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, I can imagine that, like, just as a painting, like, um, or like a, a print, and you can have it on a canvas like that, on as like a flipped um landscape. Yeah, good. You can good imagine, point, by the way. Um, so, yeah. so these pictures, these pictures can can be um. You, anybody that's interested can can reach out to me and and um, get prints of these. I've I've printed this as a really really big um, um, fine art print recently. Um, I've printed it more than once, but but recently on a really big one, and it it looked so good. I was kind of blown away and just wanted it to to keep it for myself. To be honest, <laughs> it was a it was a custom order, so but it's so. Uh, where can people get that from you, Andy? Plug plug away there. Um, so uh, either through Instagram. So there will be Instagram. Just my my handle there is Andy with a Y, Andy dot Schmid. Uh, so S C H M I D. Uh, Andy dot Schmid, or um, through my website, which is Andy minus uh, Schmid dot com. Um, and and my email there is is on the website, um, so there's no problem to get in touch. Also, there's a a whole bunch of um, other interesting photos on my website, not just orcas. It's like from all over the world and all kinds of species. So you know, it's very possible that one of your photographs is the one that inspired this painting that I did behind me it's Norway orcas with all of the scales and there's actually silver um silver flakes in that painting for all of the fallout from when oh, they nice. hunt and I think that it's very possible that one of your photos was that inspiration very cool seeing some of your work on the group and I might not have known it was you before we actually asked you to interview Andy's Andy's work has been everywhere on the group uh, for many years now. Um, like the group is almost six years uh, old. And I think this was up there from a very early stage, wasn't it, Andy? Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I, I, I love your work. I love everything about it. Composition, the lighting. Um, that almost looks too good to be real, that picture. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to send me that in a big giant format, I don't mind, Sandy. So you can work away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's lovely. Um, yeah, thanks very much for showing that, Andy. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I have one final question for you, and um, I'm sure then Elena has a few. Um, how has being a self-taught photographer influenced your creative process? And how do you plan to transition from managing digital projects to pursuing photography full time? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to um, force my way into like a full time photography career. Um, it's I think it's really it's really hard to to make a living just purely out of out of photography when i look around you know with so i i know a, a whole bunch of like photographers on on equal or higher levels and none of them makes a living purely out of photography it's always involving uh different things so some also make some 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 um artworks or, or things like that or others um organize trips so this is a, a really common model kind of become a, a tra like an expedition leader but all year round so you just move from this place to the next place and like similar schedule every year and then you have your groups and you 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 uh, bring them together and all of this but this is also again a lot of work but then you kind of put in as much work maybe as in a in an office job, 
um, but without with with just way less outcome. Of course, you get to be at or in the ocean, but then when you think ahead in in whatever like ten years or so, then you might not have done anything for your pension fund or so and uh, and and maybe get too old to do this and then you have a situation where whether yeah you will have to do something about it right and for me it's more like the other way around to be honest so i'm i'm working a, a full-time job managing digital projects and for me this allows me to to go to places like like this and kind of fully enjoy myself when I'm there. Norway is an, is a, is an exception, by the way, because I co-run uh, trips there. <laughs> but but you, yeah. But normally I would just be a, a you know like a a guest and and not be in charge of anything and just go to a place and and take photos, focus on my photography. Um, which you cannot do when you when you're a, when you're a, an expedition leader. And sometimes you need to kind of make sure people are all set and and the gear for them is ready and things like that. For me, it's really important for me. I'm I'm so biased because I, I I'm in favor of Orca and Orca, you know, the best <laughs> environment possible. But I'm like for me, it's excellent that people like you are doing expedition leadership over in Norway and other rest places like um that have featured orca because i'd rather have someone experienced in and out of the water plus understanding what's good and not bad for these orca to be in charge of the situation and actually direct it uh so it's fantastic that people like you and uh and alessandro de uh, madalina and uh and so on isn't part of this you know part the situation over there um that really actually makes me feel better than than just somebody who's out for financial gain. Mm -hmm. um, so Andy, I just want uh, to ask, is would you like to share if you have anything um, going across your career that you are right now, is there any kind of things that's not even related to Orca that you can pitch to people what you do um, and what they can avail of? Because like, I think you're, a really cool guy and um whatever it is that you do sell i'm sure people will be interested in um yeah absolutely so <laughs> thanks thanks for this uh opportunity to, to speak up but it's mainly what i briefly um touched before it's um so my 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 imagery is available um for sale as prints um and i only so i'm not running a shop i've thought about it but i i don't really want to just you know put some specific formats with fixed prices out there um and then it might end up not in not not be of interest to anybody i'd rather have people approach me if they're interested and then we'll figure out together um what fits their need best so maybe you know show me the wall where you want to where you're imagining something even can you can send me a picture i will kind of make a, a propose something what would make sense out of my my um, experience and 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 the, the way i see my images how i would like to see it up on that wall uh, and then we have a discussion about it. Maybe it will be this, or maybe it will be something else. But but I like to kind of have a dialogue, and not just a one way purchase. I want this image, and then it goes off. And uh, it's really nice because usually when I when I send out prints, I will at the end get you know some some um, some uh, images of of the living room or the, the 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 sleeping room where you see the the picture up on the wall um and and this comes through the personal connection i guess and and this is really uh, awarding to to have this um as an outcome so it's mostly um digital prints of your stuff that you said and provide services about like that for bespoke thing. and if there's nothing else that 
people can avail of it or anything like that and um, no no at the moment i mean i have i have pictures in in plenty of of um ocean and and dive related magazines but um you know how it is with those they come they're in the newsstands for for a month yeah. and the next one is there so it's it's i couldn't even say there's one out there right now that currently you can buy um i'm not i've not done a book and i'm not working on one but i would love to do one but it's it's um it's maybe something for later you know it's also um when i think about the book sometimes you 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 buy these books and you know the person behind it is similar age or so it it gives you the feeling of of like this is it now you know depending on its size if it's like a really big book you it gives the impression of this is my my life's work and my life's work is not done so i don't want to you know leave this impression i don't want to publish a book where i feel like um next season is around the corner and i will have i will come back with images that i would absolutely want to be in that book so is is kind of holding me back to to um start working on something like this well maybe You're... something small just be a seasonal catalog something that's like almost a coffee table book but a seasonal catalog because i know that so many so many young people are interested in just the photographs um where you know I have a few books that have a lot of context to them and stories behind the photographs. But when I was little, I would sit down with those books and I would just flip through the pictures over and over again. And that's and that's something that younger readers would like is just really good picture books. And it's I like that. Just I like that idea. Them. It could it could even be wouldn't necessarily even have to be a book. It could be kind of a a high-end magazine, you know, mm -hmm. a really nicely printed, but that doesn't have this, you know, here is my big book of yeah. photos. Yeah. This and is your life kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, even Orcazine is episodic. So it it could be something that went really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's many things you can do, but like you, what you, what's happening in this interview is you're putting across very specific beliefs and values and they're they're very well taught out and you know what you're doing so um like i could have i have like a lot of recommendations from a business <laughs> like because i'm a business guy and marketing guy but you know what you want to do and um and that's that's really great you know mm -hmm. just bring them on and uh, maybe i'll i'll uh... I'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't know. Those pictures make me feel like if I were there, then I could finally breathe right in that moment. Those pictures yeah. are incredible. So, and I'm a diver too. So that's where I feel the most comfortable and have the lowest respiration rate possible. Oh gosh. You never said you were a diver before, Elena. I am. I'm a certified scuba diver. No way. <laughs> um, I started when I was 12. The um the only idea or recommendation I would give, right? Um, and just please just ignore it if you want to. But what you're describing is a bespoke um a bespoke service for your your prints. But there's shouldn't be uh anything stopping you from providing both the standardized uh consumer just you know ordering a a, a standardized set. Mm -hmm. to you providing also that bespoke service on the same website. Um, and I'm sure the higher end clients would want a bespoke service for the higher cost, but there are mm -hmm. definitely the price conscious customers who want your, your products on um, a canvas to put on their house uh, for a lesser price. Um, so there would be two target audiences there to be the, the, the people who can afford that kind of bespoke service and ones that can't, do you know? But that's my only recommendation and idea, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I've, 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 like I said, I've, I've thought about it, and uh, maybe I need to think about it a little more as well. I mean, I've not, I've not talked about this with too many people, or so. So it's good to get a, a different um, opinion on this. So thanks. No, look, 
We have a worldwide uh, base of people who are part of our part of our group, as you know, and mm -hmm. you know, a great portion of them are, you know, twenty five and under. A great portion of them are. I can tell you our target. I can tell you the majority of what's going on with our audience. Majority of people are between the age of uh, twenty five to forty five. Primarily women who set make up around seventy percent of the group, and then um, the shorter end would be males. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's going on with the the group. Majority of people are female. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, anyone out there that wants to do stuff commercially with Orca, um, the target audience that's what it would be it would be female, uh, aged from t uh, eighteen to forty five. Sorry, one sec now. Um, I'm just going to pause it there for a second, okay? Uh, for me, you carry on talking. Okay, <laughs> just one second. He's got stuff to do. He also has a wee one. He has a toddler at home. so he Oh, might wow, okay. <laughs> up with a toddler. I have older children, so usually they'll come to, to come to bug me, and then they'll kind of back away. They'll see that I'm on my computer, and they'll back away right. and they'll just uh cool but uh willow willow's a little more demanding and she likes to be front and center and touch that computer but i think we have nick and i have been doing this together for a little while and we've been doing collaborations which is a lot of fun um and i did some educational writing because i am the resident marine biologist um but every now and again, we'll be Skyping and discussing things and Willow will come on and I'll sing to her and we'll play over Skype. And so I think it's, <laughs> I think it's really wholesome and cute. And I love when Willow shows up. Yeah, uh, cool. <laughs> uh, guys, you should follow on with the interview. Um, just uh, if you have any questions, Elena, fire them away. And uh, oh. it's still recording and everything. Okay, so, but you're just going to take over being a host for a second. Oh, okay, okay. So, the, so the Willow- All right, I'll continue with some of that. So um, as- as a diver, I've never been in cold water. I've always done warm water dives. Um, how would you prepare even seasoned divers to come on an expedition with you with the frigid conditions that Norway has to offer for diving? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, it's for for a lot of people that do this the first time and for, for many people, it's it's a once in a life um experience they they don't get all the necessary tips up front and so during the time they spend their kind of day by day learn how to improve their their whole like how they <laughs> what they wear and everything in terms of of staying warm um so there's a, a bunch of, of, of factors that, that are really important um, because the most of the time you don't spend in the water, you spend it on the rib or any other boat. So you spend it outside, at least if you do something similar to what we do. Um, and so you need to be prepared for the, for the outside um, conditions and temperature as well. And for this, you need you need the right gear, and and one of the most crucial part there is gloves. You need really really good warm gloves, and it's it's highly advised to also use hand warmers with this. Can be any kind of hand warmer, like these uh, one way things or like um, uh, rechargeable USB ones, whatever it is. But then. You kind of have mittens on and you just inside the mittens you hold these these <laughs> hand warmers tightly and this will prevent your hands from from getting too cold and because it always starts with the hands and let's say you're on the boat you've not been in the water and you already have ice cold hands chances are very high you will not even when the chance is there you know, then you need to take off your dry gloves, your your beanie, your scarf, your every everything that you were wearing to stay warm. You're just scared to do that, and then you you will maybe not even get in the water, which I've seen happening over and over again. So because I warm. understand, your face and your hands are the most exposed, and your feet are the most exposed to the cold yeah. when you're diving there. Yeah. So, so on the boat. And then once you get the chance to get in the water, um, then it's not, you would, you would be surprised because 
So there's there's the excitement. First of all, I mean, before you even get in the water, you need to put everything on. So putting on these wet gloves that you will be wearing, uh, you know, masks, snorkel, fins, everything on, being ready to get in the water. This already warms you up because it's moving around on this on this rib, and there's a lot of other people, and you just need to kind of work for it to to be ready. And then once you get in the water. Um, you have the excitement that will prevent you from really getting cold, and then in the water you will swim around a lot. It's 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 work kind of. It's a workout, so this will actually warm you up. So it's it's happened before then that we did actually stop for nothing, you know, with just on the look while looking for for activity um to give people the chance to get in the water and swim around because they were cold on the on the boat we've done it you know just uh get in the water swim around warm up and then come back to the boat which sounds kind of the opposite from what you would it think sounds would but it's but... actually it's actually people are never cold in the water they're always cold on the boat and so <laughs> once you get out of the water then it starts again. It always depends, you know, if you have a situation where you see you have, let's say you have um, orcas with a with a bait ball, but they're pushing the bait ball hard, which can happen. And then it moves from one place to another place in a in a in a speed where you can't follow up uh, while swimming. So you get back on the boat, try to see where they are, go around with the boat and then try to get back in. So in these breaks, you you will not put, you know, change all the gear from wet to to dry. But once you're, once you know you're not gonna go back in the water for a while, it's super important to take off all your wet gear, gloves, hoods, you know, everything, and then get back into your dry gear to to stay as warm as you can. Would you consider telling people to condition their bodies before going on a trip like that? Like just introducing themselves to ice baths and getting used to any kind of cold weather? Because a lot of people come from all over the world. And I know that there's even people from my home state, Phoenix in Arizona, um, that have gone on these trips. And Arizona mm -hmm. is a scorching place. Um, and they're never prepared for the kind of biting cold that those northern countries have. Yeah, if you if you come from a really warm tropical or whatever area um, where you never have any cold, I'm sure this this helps. If if you if you pre prepare yourself with with this kind of um, experiments, um, we it's not something we we give out as a recommendation. But also we we have to say that the majority of of the guests that that go with us they're from Europe. And most of them own, you know, like most of the gear you would usually bring and, and they go to the mountains or things like that. So they're kind of used to being in the cold. But but when I when I do get the question, I will think about this uh, next time. Remember this saying uh, really um, as an advice, trying to to use ice bath, for example, or, or, or similar um yeah. So do you provide one. certain types of gear to guests on the boat if they come from warmer climates? Or do we need do guests need to purchase their own gear before coming on one of your expeditions? No. Um so with us, but it's similar with with most um most operators that offer like a kind of a professional service, let's call it that way. Um, we offer dry suits for our guests, and these are um, thick uh, Arctic dry suits. So the kind you could also use to to dive in Antarctica or, or in in the Arctic, further up north. Um, plus undergarments, which are also special with these with these suits. They're really thick and and uh, and and uh, kind of condensed material where where the the cold doesn't come through this this much and then on top of that you would lay wear your own base layers as much as you want or can you know like so you would have multiple layers 
and 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 with the dry suits usually everybody is fine inside the dry suit and then you have of course the the hands and and the head sticking out and and these are the the most critical um uh, areas of the body i would say so uh bring it back to uh photography andy if we can um so we're going along uh you said that you do um other photography as well which is above water and different species of animal do you have anything that you can show us in terms of what would be like any an example of your uh, photography of land animals uh yeah there's a smile he's excited to show us something <laughs> There's something in mind. But there's, but there's also, uh, but there's also a lot of, a lot of. I, I don't know. Um, did you, did you share in the group ever any of my surface photos of orcas? You know, from bait balls and things like that. I have tons. Oh, whoa! So here's one. What I just, I was just, you know, when you saw my eyes going into the other screen, I was just trying to find. Something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Were you, how close were you to him? Fantastic lions for us. How? How close were you to him, uh, Andy? Um, quite close, but but we were so it was um, we were outside of a of a game park. This was in Botswana, kind of, just, uh, on the main on the main road, which is just a, a just a sand road, and um, we saw these we saw these paws, you know, um, in the sand while we were driving and constantly just hoping to <laughs> eventually spot spot something and then uh, it was a just a lone male and he was just kind of walking to the right side of us in front of us and we completely slowed down and as it was orchestrated or he was directed or something he changed to the other side of the road and kind of into these uh, into this grass and um, which was perfect because the sun was coming from the other side. So it was the, the really early morning sun. So I don't know, like 6.30 in the morning or something like this. And uh, and he just caught like this this first bit of sun and, and just looked our way. And it was just perfect, perfect moment. He looks like a young juvenile lion. He looks like he's just after leaving um, a pride, actually, you know, Perfect. going out and looking for his own one. Could well, be. his mane isn't quite as big as, as as an older individual, but I can see scars on his back from where he's been kind of mauled by his by his mates. <laughs> Lions are scary, man. They're such big cats. Yeah, yeah. So we were we were um, so this was in Botswana, like I said. So this is one of the of the rare trips I did which didn't involve diving which is, which is actually a bit of a lie because um this was last summer uh, i did 10 days or a good week on the south Af south african east coast before i i went to botswana so i did some diving there as well um so, so what's yeah. next for you andy what's next down the road I'm I'm going to the Maldives in September for um for a 10 day trip which will which I'm really looking forward to. I've been there I mean to the Maldives a bunch of times before but in the same time frame with the same uh, boat um which is run by by a friend of mine um 2 years ago the, the exact same time and the the reason why this is special is um there's it lasts let's say from sometime in july all the way through end of september october something like this is like a lot of plankton that is um blooming. bioluminescent that stuff it's it's not bio, bio, bioluminescent this is zooplankton that is just coming kind of getting stuck i don't know exactly how it happens in 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 this one particular bay in in the maldives is is a unesco world heritage site it's called uh, honifaru bay and and you just get masses of plankton in there trapped in that bay which attracts huge amounts of manta rays 
reef mantas and uh, yes. and sometimes also um, uh, whale sharks. And but this I've I've not seen a whale shark there. But last time I was there, it was there was a, a lot of mantas already, and I know there can be way more than this. So they've they've counted if I'm not wrong, up to 500 or so at a time in the Whoa. bay. It's a big bay, but still, when there's 500 in them, they're all over the place. You, Especially you, when you manta ray can go up to 20 feet in diameter, or like in in in, um, in distance from wingtip to wingtip. I could be wrong there, but it's around 20 feet, is it? 20 feet is... Uh, I always six thought meters. it was 6 no. feet. I thought it was like the average man's arm span tip to tip, but it could be yeah. wrong too. Manta, Manta rays are, ray are giant. They're gigantic. There's different and species, the and the ones you get in the Maldives. Um, I mean, there's there's the oceanic ones, the bigger ones as well, but you won't find those in in like in a bay within uh, an atoll. You will they will be really on the outside on on the ocean side. The ones there, these are the reef mantas. They typically get something like four, maybe a little more than four meters um, oh, from geez, like the huge. wingspan, but is 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 still big, still yeah, big. it's huge, yeah, oh, really yeah. Big. it's super super gentle and elegant to see, and just really uh, amazing animals to be in the water with. So um, I'm really looking forward forward to that. Does manta ray don't have stingray barbs? Do they? They don't have like yeah, a... exactly. Oh, they, they they don't have no. them, yeah. Because no. so, like, yeah, that you know yourself that that can be deadly with the stingray. Um, but yeah, oh God, that that must that's going to be an amazing trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh God, yeah, you should definitely take video of that, Andy. I will, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I will. I will bring my my um, action camera, which uh, I wasn't I wasn't very happy with um, that the one that I bought last year. So I'm gonna upgrade this for Norway because this is coming after obviously the the next thing coming up after the Maldives um for the Maldives I think this this uh, action camera will work because there's so much light it's clear blue water a lot of the time so this should not should not be a problem but for Norway I want to to just upgrade to the to the newest GoPro that will um and will be released before before actual the actual season starts and then i will just have the newest latest for that yeah you need you need big kind of um you need a big kind of chip uh for the collect light in the in the in norway yeah 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 um, so it's in them different. graphics cards do they have graphics cards in them the gopros sensors you know the the camera sensor so so the bigger the sensor the bigger the amount of light comes into the sensor which is more detailed images and they also work on the lens you know when when yeah. they when they um upgrade so every every generation has just a tiny bit better lens so mm. it's like the the steps between last year's model and this year's model it will not be huge but it it will be there yeah and it could be enough for a competition no, win. in uh, anything technology, I'm a certified idiot. So, um, um, you shouldn't talk down about yourself like that. No, really. Just technology. Yeah. <laughs> so we've well passed the hour mark, guys. Um, and we should close this out. Um, amazing conversations, and the part I was away for, I'll be surprised when I go back to editing what that was about. And <laughs> so talked about you. <laughs> <laughs> um thanks very much andy and thanks very much elena um andy do you want to give a plug to what all your social media again and uh how people can uh get in contact with you absolutely so first of all thanks for having me uh elena thanks for having me nick uh, it was a pleasure meeting you guys talking to you guys and uh looking forward to seeing the video on the, on the group um, and yeah, everybody that's watching, if you find interesting what I'm doing and, and like what you saw, um, please reach out to me if you would like to order um, your custom print, as long as I don't have this, this shop where you can just um, go and, and buy something online from me. 
Um, I'd be happy to work something out with you, see what wall you want to have it on, what would fit best, and then uh, we'll find a way to get it uh, to your home or workplace or wherever you would want something. And for everybody else, if you would like to see more of my work, um, best join or follow me on Instagram. So uh, my handle is andy.schmied, so A-N-D-Y, A-N-D-Y, yes, dot S-C-H-M-I-D. Or um, the same as my website, but not a dot, that will be a, a minus. Is it a dash? Uh, what I'll do is I'll superimpose all that stuff on this section. Ah. So, yeah, right it'll here, be right here. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. Um, so that would be cool. Um, people can follow it that way. Thanks, everybody, to uh, watching this episode. It was amazing. Andy, uh, so, much, so many interesting things being talked about today. And gosh, I'm looking forward to Manta Ray uh, content coming out. Uh, do, Besides Orca and besides um, Octopi, um, I love Manta Rays. Love them. And that memory goes back to the PlayStation 1, which they had a demo on there. I don't know if there's any nerds that way. But they had a demo on there with a big giant Manta Ray, and I just love them ever <laughs> since. Um, so anyway, thanks very much uh, for watching this episode. Please, if you read this or if you, if you see this, subscribe. Subscribe, please, please. So anyway, thanks everyone for watching and look forward to the next one. All right. Bye.